So in this video, we want to think about specifically what happens when we have an input process to a linear system that is a Gaussian random process. Now, you probably know from the prerequisite for this course that when you have a input Gaussian random process, the output is also a Gaussian random process. And this was something that was probably just taken as a fact in previous courses that you took. One thing that's nice about this is the work that we just completed in terms of figuring out the mean function of the output random process and the autocorrelation function of the output random process. These are very useful for Gaussian random processes because these are the only things that you need to completely specify a Gaussian random process. So being able to compute the mean function, the autocorrelation function, since that's all you need for Gaussians, working with Gaussian random processes and linear systems is kind of an easy thing, and these are very useful equations for working with Gaussian random processes. So nothing about that is new. What is new is what we're going to do now is we're actually going to do a more rigorous proof that when you put in a Gaussian random process to a linear system, the output is also a Gaussian random process. You probably, in an undergraduate class, you didn't actually prove this. Now that we're at kind of more of an upper level, graduate level course, let's actually go ahead and use our knowledge to actually prove that this statement is true. So for doing this proof, we're going to assume that we're working with a discrete time system and discrete time random processes. You can also do this proof for continuous time systems and continuous time random processes, but the math gets a little bit more tedious because the integral expressions in the equations have to be replaced with their um, limiting form in terms of writing it as a Riemann integral with a limit and a summation. So it just gets a little bit more tedious, so we'll just stick with discrete time systems for this proof. So our input process, x of k, is going to be a second order Gaussian random process, and it's going to be input into a stable discrete time linear system. That's important because we've already established that when we are working with stable systems with second order input processes, the output random process is always well defined. And it's well defined in terms of that it exists in a mean square sense. Specifically, the output y of k, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of y n of k, given by this summation right here, it exists in a mean square sense which means that as n goes to infinity, the expected value between the output process and yn of k, that quantity squared, goes to zero. So we already know that this thing exists because of our stable system and our second order input process. We know y of k is a well-defined quantity and exists in a mean square sense related to yn of k. What we want to do is we want to show that y of k is a Gaussian random process. That's the whole goal of this video. So what does it mean to be a Gaussian random process? Well, if you recall the definition of a Gaussian random process, a Gaussian random process is a Gaussian random process if and only if any linear combination of samples is a Gaussian random variable. So that means I can pick some arbitrary number of times to sample it. So we'll call that M. I'm going to pick M times. Those times I'm going to denote as K1, K2, K3, all the way up to Km. The times that I grab my random process, I'm going to weight by some arbitrary numbers, a1, a2, a3, all the way up to am. If this weighted linear combination of the random process I call z, if z is a Gaussian random variable, then y of k is a Gaussian random process. So what we really need to do is we need to establish that z is a Gaussian random variable, which is the same thing as saying we need to establish that z has a Gaussian distribution, because Gaussian random variables have Gaussian distributions. So that's what we need to show. To show that y of k is in fact a random Gaussian random process, we need to show that z has a Gaussian distribution. So let's think about that. Let's just pick one time. So kj, if you want to think of k sub j as k1 or k2 or k3, it doesn't matter, but we're picking just one time. We know that y at this time is the mean square limit of the sequence y sub n at that time, where y sub n is defined like this. So this is the equation we had just a minute ago for y sub n of k, except I've replaced k's with the specific time kj that we're picking. So this quantity, y sub at time k sub j, is equal to this in a mean square sense in the limit as n gets large. And of course this is true because we know that y of k is equal to y sub n of k in a mean square sense in the limit 
for any times, and all we've done here is pick a specific time kj. So the equation we had a couple charts ago that had this written in terms of k was good for any time k. So when I pick just a single time k, obviously that equation is also true since we've already stated it's true for all time. The main point of pointing this out is we're going to use this quantity on the subsequent chart, on the subsequent chart, and we're going to be taking some limits. And I just wanted to point it out that you know this is a well-defined quantity in a mean square sense. All right, so let's go ahead and define another random variable. We're going to call this z sub n. This looks really similar to z, except when I take my linear combinations of y, I'm not taking my linear combinations of y, I'm taking it of y sub n, okay? So z was linear combinations of y, z sub n is linear combinations of y n. On just the previous chart, we wrote out the definition of what y sub n at time kj was equal to. And that was the whole point of writing out that chart, so we'd have a nice expression for this. It was equal to the sum from n equals minus n to capital N, of h at time kj comma n times x of n. So all I've done from this first line to the second line is replace y sub n at time kj with the definition of what that quantity is. Now that I've written z sub n like this, it's very easy to see that z sub n is just a weighted linear combination of Gaussian random variables. Right? The input process we know is a Gaussian random process. A sub j is just a number. The impulse response at times kj comma n, those are just numbers. So I have numbers times Gaussian random variables. This is just a linear combination of Gaussian random variables. In general, there could be a lot of terms here, right? There are 2n plus 1 terms in this first sum, and there are m terms in the second sum. So that's a total of m times the quantity 2n plus 1 terms. It's a lot of things being added up but it's just a linear combination of Gaussian random variables, so we know that z sub n is a Gaussian random variable. That's really close to what we want. We're trying to establish that z is a Gaussian random variable. We've been able to show that z n is a Gaussian random variable, so we're close, but not quite there. So let's keep going. So we already talked about how y sub n at time kj converges in a mean square sense to y at time kj. For any time that you want to pick, any time kj, that always happens. On the previous chart, we were able to write the random variable z as a finite sum of the y at time kj's. Okay, that was actually two charts ago. The previous chart, we wrote zn as a linear combination of y sub n's, right? And we know that each of the yn's converges to y. What that means, and you can show, that means that zn has to converge to z in a mean square sense. So I'm skipping a little details right here, but the basic point is since each of these converges in a mean square sense to y, and since zn is just a finite sum of yn's, that means that zn converges in a mean square sense to z. So you can actually write that out rigorously and go through that. We're going to skip that partial detail for now. But zn, we know, converges to z in a mean square sense. All right, so we talked about the distribution of zn on the previous chart. We know it's a Gaussian random variable, right? So let's let fn be the cumulative distribution function of zn. So we know that fn is some type of Gaussian distribution because zn is a Gaussian random variable. Now here's the important part. I say this is a fact. What we're doing is we're using a fact about the convergence of quantities. Anytime you have a quantity that is mean square convergent, that's what we have here. We know that zn is convergent to z in a mean square sense. That implies that zn is convergent to z in distribution. So if you've taken the uh, prerequisite to this course, which was a course on random processes, we studied different types of convergence. There was surely convergent, there was almost surely convergent, there was convergent in distribution, there was convergent in a mean square sense, all these different types of convergence. We primarily spent our time studying mean square convergence. But if you recall some of the things we learned in that class, one was that if you are mean square convergent, then you are always convergent in distribution. Well, that's a very useful thing here, because we know that Zn 
is convergent to zn in a mean square sense. So that means that zn has to be convergent in distribution as well. So what does that mean specifically? That means that in the limit, as n gets large, as I, I can take the limit of the distribution function of, of zn, which we're calling fm, and that is going to give me the distribution function of z because I'm convergent in distribution. What that means also is since I'm convergent in distribution, that means the limit as n gets large of the mean of zn, by definition, converges to the mean of z, which we'll just define as mu. Similarly, since I'm convergent in distribution, that means in the limit as n gets large, the variance of zn converges to the variance of z, which we'll define as sigma squared. And now we're almost there. We're really close to being done. We're using this as a fact. This is actually something we learned in the prerequisite to this course. Mean square convergence implies convergence in distribution. Once we accept that as a fact, then we can write these down. In the limit as n gets large, my distributions of zn equal the distributions of z. And this is how we're going to solve for this distribution now. Because this is what we're really trying to get to. We're trying to get to the distribution of z. This equation gives us a mechanism to do that and get there. All right, so like I said, we don't know what fzu is yet. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to show that it's a Gaussian random variable, so we're trying to get to having a Gaussian distribution. To compute this quantity, I'm going to compute the limit as n goes to infinity of the quantity I know. Okay? I know that this is a Gaussian density function. So I can write down f sub n of u is a phi function, u minus the mean, mu sub n, divided by the standard deviation, sigma n, based on our definitions in the previous chart. So this is a write-down. I know that z sub n has this distribution because we've already established it's a Gaussian random variable. So this is just a write-down. And we define mu n and sigma n on the previous chart. This is just the mean of z n. This is just the standard deviation of zn, and we know also that in the limit as n gets large, the limit of mu n goes to mu, and the limit of sigma n goes to sigma. So now we're almost there. I want to compute the distribution of z. That's what I'm trying to get to. I know I can write it as the limit as n gets large of the distribution of z sub n, which we called f sub n. Replacing f sub n with the phi function from the previous chart, we have this. And then from this line to this line, looks like I'm doing something that's cheating. I have the limit of a function, and I'm replacing it with the function, and I brought the limit inside. In general, that is not okay to do, but for the phi function, which is a continuous valued function, that is okay to do. This is a continuous valued function, so this interchange is okay. Now I just need to take the limit of this quantity. Well, that's easy to do. The limit as n goes to infinity of the numerator is just u minus mu because the limit of mu n as n goes to infinity is mu. Same thing on the denominator. In the limit, this turns to sigma. So when we're all said and done, we've computed now that the density function for z is indeed a phi function. So z is a Gaussian random variable, and we've now established that the output random process is a Gaussian random process, because remember, z was formed by taking a weighted linear combination of an arbitrary number of points of the output random process, and we've just figured out that that random variable z has a phi distribution, so it is a Gaussian random variable. So now we're finally done.